Hey guys, what's going on? It is Filmington, and this is the third installment of the Speculation series. Sorry, you guys probably had to wait four weeks between episodes, but it's been taking me a lot of work to finalize this one, so thank you all for watching. This episode, much like the last two, we will be focusing on baseball players under the age of 27 that I think are good buying opportunities right now. We're talking about a holding period of 12 months or less. So this is all short-term flipping speculation. Um, if this was a different type of series, short-term, long-term investing, I might be recommending different players. But um, within the players that I recommend, I will be mentioning specific cards that I feel like are undervalued. We'll be talking about specific holding periods as well as my thoughts as to what the target appreciation could be. Um, again, this is all based on my opinion. It is not objective fact. It probably differs from a lot of the other perspectives from other, uh, other analysts and experts. Um, I will be disclosing my allocations in all of these players at the end of the video so you can judge any potential biases on your own. And um, all right, so before I get into the players, we're gonna be talking about six this time. Um, I wanted to level set a little bit and this might be for um, those of you that are a little bit newer to the collecting game, but there probably are some themes that you've picked up on if you've watched episode one or two of this series in that I am recommending typically three to four different products. Um, Tops, of course there's Panini too, which isn't a officially certified product for the MLB, but Tops in itself has a slew of different products. Um, it's increasing products each year. We're in an age where over the last probably eight to 10 years, they've steadily increased the print runs as well. And there really is a finite amount of money and credit available to sustain the prices of all of these different products. So what I'm trying to get to is that there's not enough people or money in the hobby today to support prices of products year over year over year. So what you'll notice is if you look at previous trending data that Topps Heritage, Topps Chrome, but mostly Bowman Chrome and Topps Flagship, that'd be Series 1, Series 2, and Topps Update, those are the products that are going to retain value year in, year out. Um, with a lot of products, there's an initial buzz. Um, maybe it sells fairly well, maybe it sells out, you can't find it at your hobby shop. But if you try to buy those singles three to six months after release, you'll notice generally, not always, but generally um, the prices have fallen a bit, okay? Where with other products, even if you look at Bowman Draft, which just came out, uh, Bowman Draft is one of the three major Bowman releases today. It's one that I really like. Um, You'll notice an initial dive a little bit in the prices after people lose interest and focus on the next new shiny thing. Maybe Bowman's Best, maybe that's Top Series 1. Um, but those generally the top players in that product, they might change, they might rotate. But when we're talking about Bowman, Top's Flagship, and even for the most part, Top's Chrome and Top's Heritage Major League, you'll see that the, uh, the prices are usually maintained over time. In a lot of cases, they go up. So we talked about the products, so now let's talk about the specific cards because there's also some themes in the specific cards that I've been pushing forward. With products, it was a demand play. With cards, it's more of a supply play, to be honest. Uh, numbered parallels, numbered refractors, Bowman Chrome first year autographs, those are some of the main themes if you caught episodes one and two. And what do they have in common? For the most part, scarcity and generally known scarcity. So you want to collect the cards that buyers can't easily find somewhere else, especially when Topps, again, has been increasing print runs on a lot of their products over the course of the last eight, nine years, especially over the last four or five. If you look at the product like Topps Chrome and the PSA pop reports, it's very noticeable. Um, so you want to have the cards that buyers are going to want and not be able to find easily somewhere else. And you also want to be sure that two years from now, there's not a whole lot more out there than what you initially uh, anticipated. So you're almost reducing your risk in a way by going for a card that has a known quantity, supply, the golds, the blacks, they're serial numbered on the back. Topps Chrome Refractors are serial numbered. So Bowman Chrome, first year, base autographs, 
are not numbered, but this is an exception that I'm definitely willing to deal with because a lot of collectors prefer Bowman Chrome autographs. A lot of collectors and investors consider that to be the Holy Grail card. Um, it sells very well. Look at trending over time. I mean, most of these cards have gone up over time for desirable players. And um, I'll tell you this, Tops slash Bowman have done a really good job uh, maintaining limited variability, basically, of the quantities available of Bowman from year to year of that autograph card. So, I mean, if you look back, I'm sure uh, 2009, Mike Trout's year, I'm sure they're cranking out more today than they were before, uh, but they are doing some things today like short printing some of these autographs um, of the more desirable players uh, in order for them to increase the print run of the rest of the product. Not desirable for those breaking the product, but very desirable for those willing to buy the single after the fact. So in the last two episodes, the values of cards that I put forward uh, regarding what you should pay for each was all based on it being in raw format. So in this episode, I've taken it a step further. I have specified in which cases I would rather prefer a high graded copy of a card. And with that, I provided pricing information, what you should pay, um, and just to provide a little bit more clarity, there's just some times where I wouldn't consider buying a raw copy of a card. Um, and it's really a function of three different things. One, the value of the raw card. If it's approaching 200 bucks or above 200, uh, if I'm buying the card online, I'm more likely to buy a graded copy of it. Number two has to do with the amount of time that has passed since the release. Um, Especially, again, if we're talking a mid to high end card, there's going to be a lot more opportunity for buyer number one, buyer number two, etc. to submit the card to a grading company and get it back, potentially even resubmitting it to the same or a different grading company. And number three is the card stock itself. Chrome surfaced cards, whether it be Bowman Chrome or Topps Chrome, are prone to surface scratches. And these surface scratches can be easily concealed in pictures, even high resolution scans, especially the ones you see in ComC. So in this, a lot of this pertains to buying cards online. So if you're at a show, if I'm at a show, I can see the card up close. Maybe I have a loop with me. Maybe I've got some pretty good lighting because a lot of these shows have kind of funky lighting. So I have a good idea of what that surface really is. I, they allow me to take it out of the plastic sleeve. Most dealers allow you to do that stuff, even with mid or high end items, I find. And, um, and then I can make a more intelligent decision. So this is mostly pertaining to online um, transactions, but that represents probably at least 75% of modern card sales. It happens online whether we like it or not, it's just the reality. The next point I wanted to bring up is just an observation I had last year. Um, I noticed that card prices fell for most players, probably starting mid-October. They didn't really start to recover fully till mid-February. Um, this year has been a little bit different. There's been a number of players, 10 to 20, that haven't seen any uh, depreciation at all. Actually, ap appreciation for a lot of these players, Fernando Tatis is one of them. He was one that... I was borderline between maybe featuring him in this series, but now I can't do that. Um, so I apologize for that. I personally have some Tatis cards. Uh, by the way, I'm now on Instagram, so check me out. Um, but yeah, it's and it's not just him. Luis Robert is another one that um, I'm sorry, but I recommended him in my previous episode and those prices are completely useless now, I'm guessing. So let's talk about the players. Again, we have six. Number one, 24-year-old Yoan Moncada. Um, he's really the embodiment of a post-hype candidate. He was formerly a number one rated prospect in the majors. And since then, he's had a couple lackluster seasons. But after a 1.1 war in 2017, a 2.1 war, 
in 2018. Last year, he had a 5.7 war. And that's even more significant because it was only in about 80% of a season, 132 games. So specifically, let's look at his other stats. Batting average the last three years, 231, 235, up to 315, which is huge. Um, strikeout rate dropped six percentage points. He had an issue with strikeouts, had over 200 uh, a year ago. He had a 27.5% rate, a little bit more palatable this year. His walk rate actually dropped from 11% which he held over the last two years to 7.2%. So his approach definitely changed considerably. Uh, he became more aggressive and his swing rate reflected that as well. It went up from 41 to 47%, uh, but, but it worked. So even though he was more aggressive, he, uh, he had a Z contact percentage, which increased three and a half percentage points. So what that means is he was making contact with pitches that fell in the strike zone uh, at a clip of 3.5 percentage points greater. Uh, his hard hit percentage was up from 36 to over 39% this year and 25 home runs. But again, this is a shortened season. So looking a little bit deeper, um, it's not all positive. Home run to fly ball ratio nearly doubled from 12 to 20% this year. So if there's significant regression, which I expect in 2020 across the board and power numbers, He'll probably lose a little bit of power too, but you know, with some more tweaks, he's still young, still capable of 25 home runs, I think, in a full season. Um, and this is just a man that's finding his way. You know, he's not going to light it up in any one statistical category. Um, steals, for instance, were just barely double digits, but plays great defense. I love the White Sox. I think they're going to be a playoff contender in 2021, and I like Yoan Mankata. So. Which cards do I like of Mankata? Bowman Chrome non autograph color refractors. Blue, about 25 bucks. Gold, 60. Orange is 90 bucks. I didn't mention the regular refractor number to 499 here because I thought it was too expensive. So that's why it's not listed. Card number two, Tops Chrome refractor autographs. Um, this is really the blue. I, I saw that I saw that it was a, just a very good deal based on a few comps I saw versus some of the other colors. You can get that hopefully for around the twenty to thirty dollar range. I think the comps are mostly around twenty actually. Uh, next up, card number three. This is where it gets interesting. He has two rookie cards in flagship in twenty seventeen. Series 1, number 210, and Topps Update US 200. One's in a Red Sox uniform, and the latter is in a White Sox uniform. A lot of people prefer Topps Update, but a lot of people also prefer that first Topps rookie card. And the Update one is not a debut. They're both standard cards with a rookie card emblem. So I checked the PSA registry, and there are 289 that were submitted versus 154. So that is 289 with series one and 154 with update that have been submitted to PSA. And we're talking base here. So it seems like most people are preferring that series one. And I think I will as well. Um, but I mean, you're getting a official rookie card either way. <laughs> and uh, I think with blacks, $64 is a good price to pay. There weren't really too many comps. Um, I forget which one that didn't have any comps, but around 64 bucks, I think, is a good price for that black. Card number four, uh, this is where we're going to talk about the, the same thing, except gold parallels. Seven to nine dollars for each, I think, makes sense. And card number five is going to be his 2016 Bowman Chrome Refractor Autographs. Um, blue, you can get for around 240 uh, raw. It's a little overpriced, I think. And this is an instance where I'd probably go graded, uh, get a graded copy for about one and a half times that. Um, True Gem BGS, at least, is what I would go for, for that 360 range, if you can. Uh, with a gold, I might also consider here, I would do, I would apply a 2.4x multiplier off the blue. The target here, exit strategy, I'm thinking four to nine months and a return of between 30 to 60 percent the longer you hold it the better next up is going to be 24 year old this is the only pitcher of the six i'm going to be bringing forward and this is jack flaherty of the st louis cardinals 2.75 era in 196 innings 231 strikeouts this was his first 
full major league season in 2019. He's a four to five pitch pitcher already. Uh, he relies a lot on his fastball and slider, but he also has a sinker, curveball, and changeup. Uh, so he he switched up his pitch mix a bit in 2019 versus 2018. He turned to his fastball in more situations than his slider and sinker. His fastball velocity was up from 92.7 to 93.9 miles per hour this year. So it was, and it was also up 1.2 miles per hour on his slider. Um, his swinging strike rate increased each of the last two seasons. It's now up to 13.7%, which is borderline elite, I would argue. Uh, compare that to Pedro Martinez in his prime. Pedro was probably in the mid-14s, but if you also compared Flaherty to Garrett Cole and Verlander this year, it would be far uh, well below what they had. But better than Verlander throughout his entire career, except for two of Verlander's seasons, including this one. Um, so he's got a decent frame. He's listed at 6'4", 205, and he held batters to a 142 batting average in the second half. He seemed to have gotten stronger as the year went on, um, which is huge for a young pitcher that's never thrown 200 big league uh, innings. And, um, and some might say, you know, you're, you're cherry picking a sample because you're just looking at his second half stats when I talk about that. But I think for players that have a limited history, looking at that second half is more meaningful, especially a pitcher, a young pitcher, where in most cases we're always going to question their durability until they can go 200 innings. Uh, again, he got stronger as the season went on. He looked really good in the playoffs as well. I would say let's look for him to improve upon his K-to-walk ratio. This year it was 4.2. I could see it being at or above 5 for next year. He accomplished that in the second half. And I see him being a top 3 National League Cy Young finalist in 2020. So what cards of Jack Flaherty should we target? Well, the first one is going to be 2014 Bowman Draft Chrome Autograph. Uh, I listed his base here for 35 bucks. If you want to go for the refractors, go for it. Um, regular refractor times one and a half multiplier. With the blue, I'd probably do times three and a half. For the gold, times eight and a half. For the orange, times 12, I would say. Um, next card is 2018 Tops Series 1 Flagship Rookie Cards, uh, talking about the gold and black parallels. And for these, I think $16 and $128 respectively would be good prices to buy for the raw versions. And target uh, exit strategy here, I'm thinking between five to nine months, really see him excel in his second full big year in the major leagues. And I could see a return of 50% here, guys. So there's always going to be a higher risk with a pitcher, but I think Jack Flaherty is one that could pan out. Next up is my pick of the episode. It is 22-year-old, turning 23 in January, Ozzy Albies. Ozzy Albies made some steady improvements to his ISO for the third straight season. What is ISO? It is isolated power, basically just slugging percentage minus average. And it ultimately reflects how much of slugging percentage was attributable to power versus average. And, um, and this is a guy that this year, if you compare him to Glaber Torres, even though he had kind of a quiet season, he had a better war than Glaber Torres. So that's a 4.6 war at age 22. He was a great defender as well, but not all of that was because of defense. He had a better offensive war than Glaber Torres. This isn't to say I don't like Glaber Torres because I do. Um, but his walk rate went up to a more palatable 7.7% this year. It was 5.3% in 2018. He had over 100 runs for the second straight season. He batted 295. He batted only 261 in 2018. He's just a guy who was very overshadowed by the other thumpers in the lineup. He had 75 extra base hits. This is a guy that really did everything. His line drive rate was way up from 21.3% to 25.5%. And I would argue that you're not going to see much power regression from him in 2020. That's because he has kind of a modest home run to fly ball rate to begin with. Um, so Atlanta is getting to be a, big, uh, a better market for the hobby. Um, they had a playoff run this year. They advanced pretty deep into the playoffs. And they have a lot of good hitters. They're looking to sign um, maybe more pitchers to add to Cole Hamels and the rest of their staff. And 
maybe be a contender for the next three to five years. We'll see. And what cards of his do I like the most? 2015 Bowman Chrome Autograph is number one. Base, you can get for about 60 bucks. Refractor, about 90 bucks. Blue, 340. I would uh, pay for a minimum BGS 9.5. I would definitely go graded uh, when looking at some of the color refractors, starting with the blue. Gold refractor, I'd probably pay 540. This is a tough set, guys. Centering and surface. So PSA 9 might be the best you'll find for gold. I think 540 is a good price to pay. And orange is fine to get in a PSA 9 as well. Just take that 540, multiply by one and a half. Next up is 2018 Topps Series 1, gold and black. This is the product that also features Raphael Devers. I think it's a very underrated product, to be, to be honest. It also has Jack Flaherty in it. $20 for the gold, $160 for the black. I think are good prices to pay. I just picked up a gold a few weeks ago at 20 bucks. Next up... 2018 Topps Chrome, not the update because the update also has autographs. We're talking regular Topps Chrome of 2018, refractor autograph colors. Blue, 65 bucks, gold, 95, orange, around 130, 135. I didn't see any comps on the regular refractor, so I did not um, include anything on that. Exit strategy, the longer the better, guys. The longer the better. But I've said four to nine months and between a 40 to 70% of return are possible. The next up is going to be a guy that's somewhat of a value play. This is a guy that probably has the most established track record of all the players that I've brought up in episodes one, two, and through the end of this one. And that is 26-year-old Francisco Lindor. This is a guy who many uh, prognosticators thought was going to have a down season after the, the leg issue that occurred in March, and they didn't think he was going to steal bases, but he did. He stole 22 bases. He still hit 32 home runs. This was a down year for Francisco Lindor. This guy's an absolute stud, uh, but he's selling for slightly cheaper than a stud is what I would argue. He's had three seasons with a five-plus war. He's an elite defensive player. Um, he's had three seasons with 32 plus home runs. I'd like to see him get that batting average up above 290 like he did in 2016 and be a little bit more patient next year. But that is why there's a little bit more of a discount than usual with Lindor. Um, this could be one of the last chances to get in on Lindor for cheap, one would say. And also, there's been a lot of rumors swirling around that a team, a big market team, might be looking to acquire Lindor whether it be the Dodgers or someone else, and that could really affect his hobby as well. So what cards do I like of Francisco Lindor? First and foremost, the 2015 Topps Chrome number 202 card. This is a base card, so it's a little bit different, again, than the cards that I'm normally recommending that have a known quantity or some sort of known or generally known rarity. Um, but this one's a short print, and there's only 183 PSA 10s. So I'd actually advise you to pick up a PSA 10 of this one. This is a very desirable card of Lindor. Uh, makes a centerpiece of Lindor PCs for sure. So I would seek that out for about 125 bucks. I think that's a good price to pay. Next up is going to be his 2011 Bowman Chrome autograph. Here I wouldn't mess with a raw copy. I would say about 300 bucks for BGS True Gem. Uh, 360 for a PSA 10. His Refractor. Um, might be tougher to find, number to 500. So 280 bucks in a PSA 9 maybe, uh, 500 bucks in a PSA 10, I think it's a good price to pay. I didn't have the blues, oranges, and golds listed here. With the blues particularly, I thought that based on comps, they were a little overpriced. 2015 Tops Update, number 82. This is the third card I'd recommend of his. This is a vertical, uh, gold and black parallels the pose isn't as cool he's throwing in this one versus the Topps Chrome. Another reason why I like the Topps Chrome more. But I think it's undervalued. I think gold for 60 bucks raw and black for 480 would be a very, very good deal for you. And the fourth card, well, I don't have a fourth card listed, but I will say that his other stuff is pretty good too. Uh, 2015 Topps Chrome autographs, um, Color autographs, heritage, refractors, the ones that are numbered to 566, 66, 
Uh, you could do a whole lot worse here by picking up some of those cards. So exit strategy, I, I have one to nine months. So one month, you might be able to get a quick gain if he moves teams up through nine months. So 20 to 50% is what I have as um, the target return there. Next up is going to be a guy I like a ton. This is the guy that would be the pick of the episode if it wasn't for Albies. And this is Monster, 22-year-old, Jordan Alvarez of the Houston Astros. Um, looking at back at some data, I noticed that Luis Robert's first Bowman Chrome autographs were actually selling for more than Jordan Alvarez. Um, which I thought was interesting because one of these guys has major league proven power. The other one has merely potential. And sure, Luis Robert does have some speed in his profile, but unless it's game-changing speed, um, competing for 40-40 seasons like what Ronald Acuna did, I don't think speed can materially impact someone's hobby um, unless they're doing it at a really high efficiency, which it's it's too early to tell with Robert. If you're having a stolen base efficiency rate of 85% or greater, then you can start to really materially affect some of those geek stats, which could materially affect your chances of getting an MVP award or being a finalist. Um, but let's talk about Alvarez, because I do like Robert as well, but I like Alvarez more. And this is a guy that had a 3.8 war in 87 games played. This is a guy that had eight, 27 home runs and 369 plate appearances, 14.1% walk rate, which is very, very impressive for a rookie. 25.5% strikeout rate, which is actually pretty good for a rookie power hitter. He had a slash line of 313, 412, 655. And some of you might be rolling your eyes and thinking that this has to do with the Houston cheating controversy that's currently surrounding them. Maybe he benefited from knowing what pitches to expect. But guess what? He had a 980 OPS in ballparks away from Houston this year. That's a 980 OPS. This guy is a stud. He's potentially already a star. If you extrapolated his stats over the course of a regular season, worth of at-bats, 160 games, 600 plate appearances plus, we're looking at a guy that would have been in the MVP conversation. You know, just saying. It's kind of a leap there, but I'm just saying. He had a 178 weighted RC plus, a 432 weighted OBA. Again, right on par with Bregman and Trout. 51.1% uh, hard hit rate. He, he had a 33% home run to fly ball ratio. This should actually come down a bit um, with league-wide regression that I'm expecting, but... 40 home runs and a 300 average is still not out of the question with full season's worth of at-bats. So the, the question should not be why is Jordan Alvarez not in 2019 Tops Update, which I know a lot of you guys are pissed off about, but it should be how did Jordan Alvarez so easily win the American League Rookie of the Year after coming up in June? Like Luis Robert, though, he's got very few cards with on-card autographs, unfortunately. So there's only going to be a couple cards that I'm recommending, and that is going to start with his 2018 Bowman Chrome autograph. Um, PSA 10 is what I'd go for, or the true BGS 9.5. PSA 10, I'd probably pay about 400. Uh, true Gem 9.5, I'd probably pay 380. Refractors and colors are definitely okay here, too. Refractor times one and a half, blue times 3.75, gold times nine, orange times 13. Probably wouldn't go after the green or purple unless I found a good deal on it. If you checked out my Instagram, I actually have purchased some greens and purples lately, but it's usually me being a little bit risky playing some sort of an arbitrage game with other cards in the set. Next card, 2018 Topps Heritage Minor League Autograph. Now these aren't going to hold their value as well as the major league autographs, but it's the best you can get now. And you know, it's, uh, it's an on-card autograph, guys. So I especially like the blue number to 99 for a hundred bucks or the black number to 50 for 150. Personally, I think the base is a little overvalued right now. Um, I guess you could pay 75 for the base, but when I checked PSA pop reports, 65 base PSA 10s, just three and one 
blue and black parallels in PSA 10s, respectively. Now, Alvarez did not have a non-autograph card in any 2018 Bowman set, but he did have his first non-autograph color parallels featured in 2019 Bowman Baseball. So this is a little bit of a peculiar situation, one that somewhat matches Juan Soto, and his 2019 Bowman standard color parallels are selling for a decent amount right now, but I think that's mostly because there's just a lack of other sought after Alvarez cards available. I think that'll change once Topps Chrome, Top Series 1 um, come out, and um, I could see that card not really moving much. Um, based on what has happened uh, to Juan Soto, again, somewhat of a similar situation, not exactly the same. Juan Soto was in multiple 2017 Bowman sets after not having a non-autograph card in 2016. Target exit strategy, six to nine months, so the rest of the world can see that this year wasn't a fluke, and the percentage appreciation, I'm thinking, is between 30 to 55%. And the last player that I'll be recommending is actually going to be the youngest one in the whole series so far. And that is 18-year-old Marco Luciano of the San Francisco Giants farm system. So right now, Bowman Draft, craze, whatever, is in full effect. Maybe not as much as NBA Prism, but for baseball... For high-end collectors, investors, flippers, speculators, breakers, Bowman Draft is the big product right now. If you go to the Bowman Chrome Facebook group or many of the other baseball card-related Facebook groups and forums on Blowout, people are all in on Bowman Draft. Um, it's kind of giving them some blinders. And this is where Marco Luciano fits in because he was in the this year's earlier release of Bowman Baseball. Um there's only so much market share to go around for all of these players and a lot of the same collectors that collect or investors that go after Bowman Baseball will also go after Bow uh, Bowman Draft. So there's a bunch of guys in this product like Adley Rushman, Andrew Vaughn, uh, Green, Bishop, there's many others, Blee Day, and some of these guys might be valuable over time. But with a product that, that's as hot as Bowman Draft, you kind of have to wait it out a little bit. There's waves, and eventually it'll normalize. Some of these players will go back down. Um, some of the pro players will end up going back up. But, again, these same collectors and investors are blinded, and they're not pouring in the same amount of money as they normally would in the Bowman Baseball guys. So there's more sellers out there than buyers is what I'm trying to get at. And Marco Luciano is a guy that is a little bit undervalued right now. If you compare him to Andrew Vaughn and Bill James' 2080 score, he's actually got a better overall rating of 55. Andrew Vaughn is only 50. Um, and Marco Luciano is reported to be three and a half years younger than Andrew Vaughn. Three and a half. That's a lot of time in prospect years, guys. Um, so... Luciano's got pretty good plate discipline, a 60 hit tool, 70 game power, 70 raw power, so he's got some power as well. He tore up rookie ball this year in 2019, 10 home runs, 8 steals, and 178 plate appearances, and that was his rookie ball. I think this is a good opportunity to let people spend money on Bowman Draft guys, let people spend money over $1,000 on a Joe Adele refractor, true gem, while you scoop up Marco Luciano at a third of the cost. What cards would I pick up of Marco Luciano? Well, it's somewhat slim pickings here. You really have a few choices. 2019 Bowman Chrome Autograph Base and Parallels is my number one choice. You can pick up a base PSA 10 for about 250. Same goes for a True Gem 9.5, I'd pay about the same. And this um, reflects an increase versus prices in early October, but certainly cheaper than where we saw them a few months prior to that. And I would also look for any standard colors, the blues, the oranges, the golds. For blue, times 3.75. For gold, times 9. For an orange, times 13 off the base. And for the refractor, times 1.5. Um, Purples and greens, I actually might consider here just because there's very few other options for Luciano. And um, just buy them opportunistically when you get a decent price. 
Try to play the arbitrage game versus other cards in the set, like a Julio Rodriguez. And I would not consider any speckles, sparkles, shimmers here. Second card I would consider is the 2019 Bowman Chrome non-auto refractors. And we're not talking mojos here. I don't really see a whole lot of upside with mojos long term for most players. Blue, 60 bucks for the non-auto refractor. Gold, 145 Orange, 210 And comps are really all over the place right now for all of those colors. Most gold comps are actually well under 100 So, and again, I'm suggesting 145 But most of those prices were probably in um, October and September when the prices were a little bit recessed. And target holding period. Two to nine months. So why two months? Well, two months is reflecting me thinking that Bowman prices are temporarily recessed versus Bowman draft. And I really think that Luciano's cards are just bound to go up in the next few weeks or a few months. And up till nine months on Luciano, give him a little bit more time to develop um, into A ball, maybe even double A ball this year. Who knows? He's still super young. So if he doesn't make it to double A ball, then no harm, no foul, really. And I am expecting a return of between 20 to 40%. That is it for today's episode. Probably a little bit longer than the last couple. And um, thanks for tuning in. Let me know what your thoughts are of any of the players that I mentioned. There's probably going to be one more, maybe two more speculation episodes to come. And um, take care, guys. Filmington, out.